Chapter Four of the Adventures of a Nature Guide by Enos Mills. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Poor naked wretches, wheresoe'er you are, that bide the pelting of this pitiless storm, how shall your houseless heads and unfed sides, your looped and windowed raggedness, defend you from seasons such as these? Shakespeare chapter four trees at timberline all day i followed the dwarfed battered uppermost edge of the forest through the heights of the rockies my barometer steadily said that we were two miles higher than the sea from a stand of dead timber i cut eleven small trees and carried them in one load to my campfire they were so gnarled and ancient looking that they aroused my curiosity and with a magnifier I counted the annual rings in each. The youngest was 146 years of age, and the oldest 258. The total age of these 11 trees was 2,191 years. These and other trees had blazed in my fire and fallen to ashes long before I fell to sleep beneath the low and crowded stars with rare exceptions the trees at timberline are undersized and of imperfect form a forest only eight feet high is not uncommon one winter a tough staff that i used was almost an entire tree which had been nearly four hundred years in growing a tree that i carried home in my pocket the microscope showed to be more than three score and ten years old annual rings in many of these timberline trees are scarcely one one hundredth of an inch in diameter while a fate favored cottonwood or eucalyptus may in one season envelop itself with a ring that is more than an inch in diameter the age of a timberline tree cannot be approximated by its size or appearance or by the size or the age of its neighbors it may have lived twice as long and it may have endured more hardships than its nearby fellows of similar size and appearance environment has shaped many timberline trees into huge and crooked vines still others are picturesque bell-shaped individuals formed by the deeply drifting snows pressing the limbs downward and against the trunk during the summer months the limbs partly regain their natural position and the result is a slender bell shape in tall trees and a heavy bell outline in stocky ones instead of a symmetrical limb development many trees are one-sided imagine a tree with storm threshed limbs all flung out on one side of the trunk like a tattered wind-blown banner then imagine thousands of bannered trees scattered and grouped in a mountainside forest front the climatic conditions at the forest frontier are trying but timberline trees are hardy and probably have as long or even longer lives than the majority of their more fortunately placed relatives the oldest timberline settler that i ever studied had been permanently located at an altitude of 11,437 feet for 1,182 years when finally killed by fire. Much branched and stocky, its height was 12 feet and its diameter a foot above the earth was 4 feet 6 inches. What these timberline trees lack in symmetry and heroic size, they make up in hardiness and aggressiveness. Timberland in the far northland marks the latitudinal limits, while the mountain timberline shows the altitudinal limits of the forest life zone. The forest furthest north ends in a ragged, battered edge against the Arctic prairies. The polar storms that sweep across the broken ice fields and barren lands meet with first resistance in the advanced, low-crouching timberline of sturdy spruces. 
timberline far up the sides of high mountains is as strange and as abrupt a boundary as the crooked and irregular shoreline of the sea this mountainside timberline is the forest's uppermost edge above are the treeless distances and barren heights of the arctic alpine zone below and away from the ragged edge drapes and rolls the dark and broken robe of forest like old ocean's shifting and disputed boundary line timberline is a place where contending forces ever surge and roar nowhere does this forest frontier the ever contending line of battle between woods and weather appear more stormy or striking than in the high mountains of the west for miles this timberline extends away in a front of dwarfed and distorted trees millions of them ever fiercely fighting a relentless enemy the veterans show the intense severity of the struggle as they stand resolutely in their inhospitable heights timberline trees are among the distinct attractions of our national parks timberline is probably the most telling in the rocky mountain national park but in the yosemite mount rainier and glacier national parks it has striking phases it is an illustrated and graphic story one of the most powerful in the book of nature in colorado this mountainside tree line is two vertical miles above the shoreline of the sea like the ocean's edge timberline has miles that are straight and level as a die but in places it sweeps outward around a peninsula and follows the crooked line of an invading canyon there are forested bays beautiful coves and wooded islands stretches of forest climb high ridges and invading outposts make a successful stand in favorable spots among the snowfields far above the main forest front violent dry winds that blow ever from the same quarter are a powerful relentless foe of many a forest frontier they either point all limbs toward the leeward or prevent all limbs except leeward ones from growing trees are pushed out of plumb and entire forests are pushed partly over then overweighted with snow they are forced down to earth and flattened out the wind and snow never allow them to rise again and they become in effect huge vines or low long-bodied prehistoric animals headed to the leeward they refuse to die and many live on for centuries snow cold and dryness are the chief factors which determine whether the forest may or shall not grow in some localities the snow line is the barrier that forms the timber line dryness of locality combined with dry winds resists forestation but the sand blasts of dry windy localities play havoc by beating and flailing the trees this sand beats off the bark on the trees stormward quarter exposing their very bones often it eats its way into the already half flayed trunks the stormward half of many trees is dead and lifeless a sand graven totem pole while the living half holds long tattered limbs streaming leeward this gale-blown sand frequently prevents trees from growing higher than the shelter behind which they stand in places so-called trees may be seen with trunks one to three feet in diameter and only one or two feet high cut off by the sand fire of the high winds numerous long limbs reach out from the trunk in all directions the shoots which these limbs send up are clipped off by the wind shot sand in time this treetop is a table or brush of bristles twenty feet across 
and trimmed off as level as a lawn hundreds of these trees are often crowded together until the identity of each is lost forming acres of clipped low tree lawn the wide-spreading mass is too low to crawl under and not quite strong enough to allow one to walk on the surface it is a good mattress to sleep on often i have rolled out of one of these treetop beds without discovering the tumble till morning snow slides landslides and other factors often pile up embankments of debris and these form large windbreaks whose shelter allows trees to grow in places formerly wind-swept and inhospitable trees at timberline are eternally vigilant and promptly seize every new opportunity or opening one spring a landslide on the slope of mount clarence king piled a shipload of stones on a wind-swept treeless flat a few years later several dozen spruce were growing up in the leeward of this chance made shelter but slides or other forces occasionally remove shelters behind which a forest front was formed or they place an obstruction which changes the course of the prevailing winds snow slides occasionally cut an avenue down into a forest which exposes the trees on the edges of the new avenue or an old stretch of forest front is sheared off by a slide with the hardened front ranks removed the less hardy trees thus exposed are slashed and shot to pieces by the cutting edges of the prevailing gales one day i came out upon a long hedge-like growth of trees extending down the slope here the high sand flinging winds blew from the west to the east a lone boulder about six feet in diameter at the west end of the hedge had sheltered the first tree that had grown up to the leeward of it then another tree had risen in the shelter of this one and still others in order and in line eastward until the long hedge was grown the straight line of the hedge from west to east showed that the high winds were always from the same quarter and the topography of the place had compelled them to rush along the straight line which they had followed the front of this hedge was the diameter of the boulder and the further end about two hundred feet away was about a foot higher each summer thousands of shoots and twigs grew out on the top and sides but each succeeding winter the winds trimmed them off long afterward in pursuit of a woodchuck one day a grizzly dug out a few tons of earth and stones by the side of this boulder frost and water undermined until gravity caused the boulder to roll over the hedgerow was quickly sandblasted to pieces and in a few years all that remained was a number of stubby trunks half round with the flattened stormward side fantastically ground and engraved by the wind and sand i have followed the timber line for hundreds of miles in the sierras the cascades and the rocky mountains one evening i camped on the rim of wild basin in what is now the rocky mountain national park out of the opposite side of the basin long's peak swept ruggedly far up into the sky i was on the eastern slope of the continental divide great light bars miles in length and long shadow pennants of peaks lay across the basin as the sun descended these lengthened and pushed down the descending slopes finally they reached out upon the great plains nearly a hundred miles distant nearby a solitaire sang with inspiring and unrivalled eloquence he sang from a crag and from a treetop and then with intense ecstasy while darting and dropping wheeling and gliding 
he gladdened the air above his nesting mate once he rose high above the shadows and for a moment poured forth his song in the bright sunlight above as he ceased the beavers began making merry in a pond just below i watched them and the purple ripples they made presently the ripples faded from sight but in the darkness the easy movements and dividing wavelets of the swimmers were revealed by the rocking of the reflected stars in the night a white crowned sparrow repeatedly sang briefly a camp bird quietly waited for my awakening later a tiny chipmunk bashfully called an astonished squirrel first stared in silence then with a jerky note scolded and bluffed from a safety first distance but at last gave way to curiosity and came closer big game is common along the boundary of woodland and grassland deer and elk frequent timberline during the summer and mountain sheep may be seen at any time in the autumn it is frequented by bears the mountain lion coyote and fox come to this edge of the woods to watch and wait and here concealed gaze out upon the upland open beautiful lakes gouged by glaciers out of solid rock are scattered along the furthest edge of the forest they are one of the distinctive charms of these arctic gardens with a border of wild cliff a waterfall a fringe of brilliant flowers grassy spaces picturesque trees in clusters and singly these lakes are wildly poetically lovely on the whole the heights are becoming drier many summits are no longer tolerant to the trees parts of the rocky mountains are in the arid belt and their winters are often extremely dry dry high winds frequently sweep their summits sucking moisture from all vegetation the unprotected trees in the forest front of dry ridges suffer greatly thousands perishing during a single dry winter i walked for hours along a dry summit slope strewn with the bleaching bones of millions of veteran pines and spruces here over a long front the battle had gone against the forest the nearest frontier was half a mile down the slope timberline is not fixed in places it is creeping forward and upward in other reaches it is being driven back still other boundary lines like those of nations are stationary for years then suddenly these are obliterated and redrawn as territory is lost or won only a few of the earth's numerous tree people dwell at timberline those most commonly found both at timberline in the heights and low levels of the north are pine spruce fir aspen birch and willow on the eastern slope of long's peak timberline is approximately two miles above sea level here in a moist place by a tiny tributary of the mississippi grow engelmann spruce alpine fir black birch aspen and arctic willow on a nearby dry slope all the trees are limber pines on mount orizaba close to the equator timberline is maintained above the altitude of thirteen thousand feet in the rockies of colorado and in the sierras it is at approximately eleven thousand five hundred feet the highest timberline of normal trees in the united states that i have found is on a gulch of the san juan mountains at an altitude of twelve thousand three hundred feet here are upright trees more than a foot in diameter and sixty feet high timberline in switzerland is about six thousand five hundred feet on mount washington about five thousand on mount rainier about seven thousand in most localities it is higher on the southerly mountain slopes than on the northerly 
in the far north the altitudinal and latitudinal timberlines converge and form the defensive outpost of the forest on the edge of the polar world broken wildflower gardens crowd and color every ragged opening among the picturesque tree groups on the forest frontier many of these flowers are dwarfed and tiny but in moist places they grow thickly and tall among the last trees i have seen wild sheep wading shoulder deep through wide meadows of colored bloom a typical timberline garden is a ragged edged acre fenced off and sheltered by a weird low wall of trees here and there a blooming open way connects it with an adjoining garden a young tree clump and a boulder pile add artistic touches here and there appear low-growing many tinted flocks tall stately columbines with silver and blue ribbons at the top blue mertinesia taller still paintbrushes touched with a variety of shades anemones gentians white monk's hood and bending upon its stem a ray-faced golden-brown gallilardia one winter the snow drifted deeply over a stretch of forest as large as a huge circus tent the following summer it partly melted the next winter new snow was added and the following spring the drift was larger than before it did not melt away until the third summer in the meantime the several hundred spruce trees were kept asleep in a natural cold storage and had failed to grow this is why their annual rings were two less in number than those of the neighboring trees of the same age trees have tongues they record in their annual rings the larger experiences of the years the triumphs of friendly seasons and the batterings and the burns that fall to the lot of those in the front ranks of high mountain forests a timberline veteran might tell of the wealth of moonlight on a winter night with forest outposts half buried in the white snow of crowded stars in the field of space of terrific winds and irresistible avalanches of vast snow piles with flying snow in perfect autumn days and during mist-filled nights i have slept and communed with my campfire at timberline timberline gives one the feeling of being on the edge of things envelop it in unevenly moving mist and everything seems a mystery the strangely shaped trees and the weird forms of tree clumps half revealed are a part of the indefinite the uncomprehended add to this vague realm the magic of a campfire and one loses the experience of ages and again is a primitive crouching fire worshipper in a new and unexplored world a campfire ever recalls the ages long past and paints primeval scenes through all the centuries the campfire has been a place of safety and comfort of hope and cheer though they stand in one place all their years trees have adventurous lives from their seedling days to battered old age and stored in their unrolled and untranslated annual rings are their records and perhaps glimpses of the ever-changing scenes in which they grew sometimes while watching my changing campfire blaze i have half believed that the blazing tree was picturing with fire the story of its life the larger experiences of the years the triumphs of the good seasons and the failures of the bad the battles with wind and frost with fire and insect foes surely no picture ever painted is more suggestive than the campfire with it the imagination brings the dead past back to life and its people in fitting scenes 
act again the parts they once played the big trees of california are the greatest living wonders of the world in the serene sierras they have achieved the dignity befitting the largest and the oldest living things upon this earth compared with these big trees the timberline trees of the rockies are pygmies and infants yet who shall say that the life story of the timberline tree is the less inspiring to stand beneath the big trees is to feel the silent eloquence of the noblest of a noble race to stand above the dwarfed and battered front ranks of the intrepid timberline forests where the storm king reigns and the eagle soars is to live with fired imagination through all the long years of battle and to feel the triumphs of the unconquerable timberline touches the heart with a sense of universal kinship end of chapter four chapter five of the adventures of a nature guide by enos mills this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five wind rapids on the heights terrific winter winds occasionally sweep through the high passes of the continental divide believing that their velocity was sometimes more than one hundred miles an hour i planned to go up and measure the velocity of the next wind that appeared to be exceeding the speed limit an air meter was placed in granite pass this was on the longs peak trail about one mile beyond the limits of tree growth and at an elevation of more than two miles above the level of the sea one february morning the rush and boom of the wind among the pines proclaimed that previous speed records were likely to be broken i left my cabin and started up to the meter which was about three thousand feet higher than my cabin and five miles from it in irregular succession the heavy waves of wind rolled down this slope into the forest a splendid and stormy sea roared through the treetops the first half mile was through a thicket growth of tall young pines these young and pliant trees were bending shaking and streaming in the wind i turned aside from the trail to see the behavior of the tallest woods a dense growth of engelmann spruce at the bottom of the steep slope of battle mountain i climbed into a treetop one hundred feet high around me the tall and crowded trees were swaying and bowing through a dignified dance invisible wind breakers produced sudden dips and vigorous sweeps that my old tree thought he enjoyed occasionally the treetop swayed in one direction then bowed in another once he nodded in succession toward all points of the compass tracing a wavy circle perhaps twenty feet in diameter then he straightened up again to the perpendicular the entire forest was suddenly tilted forward by a violent wind wave and without the least warning i was clinging to a leaning tower engelmann spruce wood is not celebrated for toughness so i quickly descended to earth in the shelter of the storm battered trees at timberline i looked out into the yellow sand filled air upon a treeless arctic moorland the gale tore among the trees with ever varying intensity sand and gravel pattered and rattled against the scarred and veteran pines i climbed a low stocky tree which the hardest wind wave struck this tree was so rigid that it quivered and oscillated like a building in an earthquake at the altitude of eleven thousand five hundred feet i emerged from the woods and faced the gale it assailed me with a sand blast that bruised my hands and brought blood from my face and speedily drove me back into the woods 
again i tried this time i crawled forward between low heathy growths at the start these afforded a little protection but as i advanced the wind swept through more swiftly and violently i was glad to crawl out into the open moorland here after an advance of a few hundred yards i paused to rest in the lee of a butte of granite thicker than hail the sand and gravel rained down upon me a roll of my coat caught a handful much of this consisted of sand bits the size of a pencil point but there were a few pieces of gravel the size of hazelnuts the remainder was rock dust crushed by colliding with the cliff it was a warm dry chinook wind its temperature was several degrees above the freezing point there had been but little snow and only a few small icy drifts lay scattered upon the brown bare moor the sun shone in a cloudless sky but the air was so filled with rock dust that objects more than one hundred feet away were out of focus in the hazy yellow air the effect was that of a desert sandstorm the wind however was of greater velocity and carried less dust than in desert storms leaving the shelter of the cliff i again advanced by crawling a brief stop was made behind a rock point about five feet high here the wind poured down upon me with such force that it could not be endured thus far above the limits of the trees not a living thing had showed itself but in crawling along the edge of an icy snowdrift i came upon a number of ptarmigan many were sitting in little nests just the size of their bodies which they had made in the hard snow a few were bravely feeding squatting low they grabbed at weed seeds and other edible objects that came sifting down over the snow though in a sheltered place one of them was occasionally bowled over by the wind on regaining its feet it struggled back into its nest but not one risked opening its wings apparently they considered me as harmless as a mountain sheep with curious eyes they allowed me to crawl by within three feet the wind met me with violent dashes with moderate movements and with occasional intervals that were almost calm in many of its rushes the wind rolled forward like a stormy breaker with invisible unbroken wave front in a sustained roar at other times this great wave was broken into wild maelstroms terrific spirals of various diameters and tilted at every angle sometimes a wave went forward with long bouncing leaps bounding entirely clear of the earth for long distances then striking heavily to roll and break like a breaker on the beach occasionally over a small space there was an explosive effect that sent dust and gravel flying with slouch hat and mittened hands i protected my face as best i could a few times a violent narrow whirlwind cut unrestrained into unrelated air currents like the explosion of a cannon and by sheer speed and force it smashed its way diagonally across and through other rushing winds most of the time i crawled but occasionally during a calm i rose up and ran forward a few hundred feet except during lulls it was perilous to stand erect these winds could not be withstood by bracing main strength did not answer rarely did they strike straight forward they struck on every side seldom was i blown over but i was kicked into the air and i was sometimes knocked down or hurled to one side at last i gained the air meter it was up at twelve thousand feet and stood where the wind simply pounded through the pass 
the meter cups were making a blurred wheel of speed a few times they showed the wind at one hundred and seventy miles an hour around me were high peaks and deep canyons level plateaus and crag torn slopes these intercepted and deflected the wind waves and currents against these obstructions the powerful invisible wind hurled itself more uproariously than storm-stirred sea against defying and moveless shore ever from some quarter came an unending roar splendid were the deep sounds and thunderings ponderously heavy and prolonged were the booms of the wind these often mingled with terrific crashing explosions which even the elastic air did not always soften there were long ripping sounds as the diverted wind rolled up a slope or tore around a corner then strange were the seconds of ominous almost breathless calm after reading the meter i went higher carried away with the wild elemental eloquence of the storm i concluded to get effects from the high ledges and finally from the summit of long's peak every step advanced every new height somehow gained was a fight it took all my endurance and it stimulated utmost alertness i simply crawled forward and upward and i wrestled with an invisible unresting contestant who occasionally tried to hurl me over a ledge or smash my bones against the rocks for a mile i made my way across a moraine with the wind beating against my right side the scattered boulders made traveling difficult many were large and had to be climbed over such activities often gave the wind the eagerly used opportunity of shooting me with icy pellets and of knocking me off my feet at the altitude of thirteen thousand feet the trail was through a rocky opening called keyhole here the wind rushed in an invisible but irresistible flood to go against it was sheer madness so i climbed down and around keyhole while doing this as i lay flat on my face i was caught by a rush of wind it lifted me a foot or two then jammed me back after repeating this it pitched me headlong the wind swept out of the west and came in contact with the divide at right angles on the east the wind blew everywhere but strangely enough on the western side it struck the mountains from eleven thousand feet upward below this was perfect calm by watching the whirling snow and other wind-blown materials i judged this wind current to be about two thousand feet thick above approximately thirteen thousand feet was an air current moving in nearly the opposite direction in crossing the divide this wind that was blowing high above the earth on the west side closely raked the earth on the eastern side from points near the top of the peak i looked out over my home to the east two thousand feet above it the air was comparatively free from dust to the east i saw a number of birds flying high and plainly in a calm stratum of air as i continued upward above thirteen thousand feet the wind gushed and stormed through the narrow openings between pinnacles and around the large rocks in debris piles i crawled through a number of these openings there are rapids in rivers and rapids in air streams running a river rapid in a boat is exhilarating crawling through a wind rapid is even more intense it lacks most of the exhilaration that goes with the river rapid but exhilaration is not wholly absent in bays and channels of the sea 
the restless waters wildly eddy powerful invisible undertows and whirlpools are present where wild defiant winds are diverted rock projections behind which i hope to find shelter were more unfriendly places than the open the wind appeared to round them with increased speed and to batter the leeward more furiously than the stormward front around a number of rocky projections the wind revolved with swirling rapidity it hurled me off with centrifugal motion each time i made close approach once i blundered by breaking into one of these whirls and was roughly handled while in and while getting out of it each time that i hugged the earth more closely than usual the wind took a sheer delight in paying me personal attentions while many of these calls were with evil intentions the others were but the investigations of the curious i was grabbed and then slammed back i was trampled upon and several times was recklessly dragged over rough stones i was occasionally raised gently upward then laid gently down rolled slowly over then turned slowly back once i was picked carefully up by a current that carried me off as carefully as if to first aid but from this i was rudely snatched by an angry wind whose every effort was to put me in need of this aid the most difficult and dangerous place was at a point at an altitude of about fourteen thousand feet this was where a long narrow gulch and a fan-like slope converged and ended on the summit of a narrow ridge beyond which there was a narrow ledge bounded by an unbanistered space sweeping upward three thousand feet from the bottom of a canyon came the wind through converging channels that ended in this one narrow gorge my struggles were intense in the last few feet of this channel the gorge in which i climbed was extremely steep yet so powerful was the wind current that all my strength was required to prevent being torn loose shot upward and thrown over the precipice icy fragments torn from the walls twigs from a mile below went hurtling and rattling by and shot far out over the precipice had i let go for even a second i should have followed them not for an instant did the wind stop it had the constant rush of rapids i eased myself upward in the rushing wind crawling close holding with hands and anchoring and holding rear down by hooking feet behind and beneath rocks trail conditions were favorable and these together with my climbing experiences endurance and knowledge of the place were of advantage to me all these were needed just before reaching the top of the narrow ridge and the precipice i felt the wind getting the better of me and feared that a slightly more violent rush or surge would tear my holds loose so i concluded to reverse ends putting a shoulder against a rock point i allowed the wind to push my legs around then forward i was then going up feet foremost instead of head foremost the gully was so extremely steep that i was almost standing or walking on my head this reverse of ends enabled me to brace effectively with my feet and also to hang on more securely with my hands little by little i eased myself upward there was no climbing the wind sucked dragged pushed and floated me ever upward at last i safely crossed the ridge rounded a point and sat down for a long rest on the famous narrows of the longs peak trail the narrows is a ledge with a precipice in front and a wall behind 
this wall rises precipitously to the summit the precipice makes a wild steep descent of two thousand feet it is none too wide for a thoroughfare that has unbanistered space before it fortunately it was sheltered from the wind otherwise traversing it would not have been either safe or sane why did i in this perilous gale in this wild wind venture precipices and go up into the sky on a peak nearly three miles above the seven restless seas irresistible is nature's call to play this call comes in a thousand alluring forms it comes at unexpected times and sends us to unheard of places we simply cannot tell what nature will have of us or where next but from near and far ever calls her eloquent voice in work and in dreams she shows a thousand ways suggests the presence of wonderlands yet unseen she pictures alluring scenes in which to rest and play in mysterious ways she sends us eagerly forth for unscaled heights and fairylands of these she whispers or of them she sounds her bugle song she fascinatingly commands and charms us to other scenes we rush to respond and fix our eyes on a happy horizon toward which we hurry but ere we reach it she calls elsewhere and elsewhere with highest hopes of a boy at play we hasten it was seriously splendid to play with these wild winds there is no greater joy than wrestling naked-handed with the elements my most uncertain work was a little below the summit the ridge that had shielded my crawling came to an end i was on the edge of a steep short slope that ended at the top but this slope was smooth and icy and at the bottom paid tribute to a precipice it was too slippery to climb across it swept the deflected wind current on the opposite side the current struck a ridge and with diminished force shot upward to the summit apparently this wind rushed as steadily as a mountain river it was swift enough to sweep me across but if it hesitated after i cast my lot in it down the toboggan slope i would slide eagerly I pushed myself out into it and let go. Across it rushed me, sprawling, bumping me into the rocky ridge beyond. Here the interrupted current lifted me upward. I had little else to do than guide myself. Rapidly it boosted to the top. Standing on the edge of the summit, I turned for a moment to look back down this icy slope which later I must somehow retrace. The summit of Long's Peak is 14,255 feet above the sea and about 400 feet in diameter. It is comparatively level, though not smooth. Granite stones and slabs of various sizes cover the top. In terrific weighty rushes, the wind splendidly thundered against the west wall of the summit all this time the wind was continually roaring round lower pinnacles and terrifically booming against the lower obstructions the old peak met these cyclonic rushes with strange impassiveness without a tremble deflected by the west wall the current shot upward for a hundred feet or so the top of the peak was thus left in comparative calm. I ventured too close to the west edge, and my hat was torn off. It started skyward like a rocket, but less than 100 feet above the peak, it fell out of the uprush and into the large, slowly rotating eddy that covered the space over the top, slowly around in a large air whirlpool the hat was carried i threw a number of stones trying to bring it back to earth 
presently the forward current caught it then like a duck in a wind the hat shot forward pointing straight at a lower and nearby lighting place a flock of rosy finches were feeding off the stuff that sifted down out of the wind as i watched them they were unmindful of the wind and had thought of no danger but behind a nearby stone a beady-eyed weasel watched and waited far down the range to the south quantities of snow were being explosively hurled into the air this showed that there had been a recent snowfall and also that the wind had just reached that scene the scattered snow was thrown high in the air into spirals and whirls and then seized and carried flying to the leeward this powdered snow trimmed the peak points with steamy whirls and gauzy banners and silky pennants through which the sunlight played northward for one hundred miles the gale was sweeping eastward and a stratum of dust hid the wyoming plains the sky above was clear and strangely blue the sun shone brightly my shadow against a granite monolith stood out as if of a dark and sculpted figure cut from stone end of chapter five chapter six of the adventures of a nature guide by enos mills this librivox recording is in the public domain the woods were made for the hunters of dreams the brooks for the fishers of song to the hunters who hunt for the gunless game the streams and the woods belong there are thoughts that moan from the soul of a pine and thoughts in the flower bell curled and the thoughts that are blown with the scent of the fern are as new and as old as the world sam walter foss chapter six the arctic zone of high mountains the peaks and plateaus of high mountains are distinguished by a climatic zone that is somewhat similar to that of arctic regions many species of plants and birds of polar zones are found in the broken summit lands of the rocky mountains the sierra and other high lifted mountains the alps the summit slopes of the himalayas and other asiatic mountains those of mexico and the andes all carry their own characteristic arctic gardens mount washington and a few of the peaks of new england and new york and numbers of the peaks in national parks carry luxuriant wild arctic gardens on their high-held heads and shoulders on mount rainier between the timber line and the snow line there is perhaps the greatest wild garden in the world a great brilliantly colored wreath a mile wide and fifty miles in circumference encircles the peak touched here and there with glaciers on mount mckinley between three thousand and seven thousand feet above the sea is another splendid and magnificent garden filled with wild flowers and wild life in the colorado rockies the arctic outpost that lies above the timberline embraces about five million acres it has more than one thousand peaks these sky-held island-like areas more than two miles above the sea are less known than islands of the south sea they carry lakes canyons tundras moorlands snowfields and many a lichen tinted cliff and rock slide this mountain plateau region of the rockies which lies between the peak summits and the timberline is a world by itself it has its storms and its moving wreaths and strata of clouds and also its full share of sunshine it carries rare scenery and its countless outlying rims and edges 
where the plateaus of the sky break off and steeply descend into lakes canyons and mountain valleys are seen commanding viewpoints these are close to the stars show the forests and streams the lights and shadows below and the sunset clouds on the nearby horizons of the sky brilliant wild flowers enrich the treeless prairies and the grassy sedgy meadows many are dwarfed to tiny smallness but others grow with even greater than lowland vigor their colors are varied and brilliant and many are perfumed in these skylands numerous birds nest and sing here bears and woodchucks roam grasshoppers leap and fan their wings and butterflies float in painted glory it is the home of the bighorn and the coney the ptarmigan and the rosy finch too enjoy this realm throughout the year but the summer visitors are also happy deer elk coyotes southland birds and eagles all make merry on its peaks and moorlands so too do the flocks of birds of many species from lowlands and far north who briefly visit it during the early autumn for picnic feasts while journeying toward winter homes somewhere under the southern skies one of the strangest wildlife gatherings that i have ever seen was in the arctic alpine zone of a mountain plateau twelve thousand feet above the sea if you wish to have an experience entirely new to see wild birds and wild animals in a happy commingling in the mountains to witness a boisterous wildlife feast and fair then visit the realm just above the timberline in the rocky mountains when the birds are flying south no food station along the way of migrating birds can show a more motley or spectacular gathering than an autumnal one on these heights it is often made up of flocks of migrating birds representing numerous species they come from alaska from the barren lands the mountains of british columbia and the birch margined streams of the north woods they are bound for winter homes and picnic lands in texas mexico cuba orinoco and argentina in addition to migrating birds there are resident birds and visitors from down the mountain slopes birds from the southland that have summered in the heights and birds that have come up from near but lower territory for this autumnal feast they gather from near and far like folks at a fair each spring most birds move northward a few hundred or a few thousand miles most of them nest and summer in the scenes which their ancestors selected as soon as the children are ready to travel they start for the southland as a rule they travel by easy stages though a number of species travel rapidly but all must have food along the way and in the healthy places of the heights close to the eternal snowflakes in the arctic moorlands of the rocky mountains two miles above the level of the sea many birds pause and celebrate with this celebration they close summer begin autumn and anticipate the winter the setting for this festival is one of strange beauty and wild magnificence the forest frontier with its scattering of dwarfed and storm-battered trees curtains this stage from the world below storied old snow piles are a part of the scenery so too the high near peaks the enormous moraines the clear brooks glad and wild with energy vigorously beginning a thousand mile journey to the sea crags stand in healthy meadows and huge scattered boulders are near the low-growing arctic willows leaves in the forest edge are taking on autumn color and in the open spaces the mountainside is bright with late flowers 
in these moorlands are scattered the last and best of nature's crop of choice berries kinnikinick currant wintergreen blueberry and bunchberry in the lowlands the berries have been gone for days and even weeks one feels that nature is taking unusual liberties in the plant world that summer has added a postscript to her season and has climbed the mountain tops for the benefit of her feathered and furred creatures arctic plants are scattering their seeds to the winds the succulent leaves of many of the plants which further down the mountain slope or in the valley have long since made plans for winter are here in season and hanging on in all their early summer beauty with the last of summer with its flowers berries and seeds are grasshoppers and numerous accompanying varieties of insects that live upon the small plant growths butterflies also flourish in this land of much sunshine and few storms and add their touch of beauty to the landscape but they are susceptible to the slightest change in temperature or weather and at the first warning from cloud or wind drop to the ground and remain motionless until all is clear again besides resident and migrating birds there are resident animals and those that have climbed up from the lower slopes these wild creatures both great and small are certain to find and to enjoy the rare feast that nature spreads this region above timberline is little visited by man and rarely are its spectacles seen the bighorn sheep the monarch of the mountain tops sometimes looks on at these feasts he is at home among the crags in any season or condition of weather and travels over the steep and rocky prominences with as little concern as though it were the most ordinary of accomplishments sheep often cross the paths of deer and elk who go to these heights for choice pasture and at this season of the year it is not unusual to find both grazing in some rich upland meadow from an advantageous point upon an outreaching crag an uninvited guest at their reception i was absorbed in watching a pair of bears that were slowly deliberately approaching a berry patch when the shadow cast by the low soaring eagle diverted my attention the bears apparently quite unconcerned by the eagle's invasion of their territory proceeded to devastate the berry patch it was evident that their work of laying up supplies for winter hibernation had begun white-crowned sparrows and juncos flew from the bushes annoyed by the invading bears then flocks of birds large and small began to arrive within two hours i saw many of the species of bird life that i had followed with glass and camera in forest and lowland during the spring and summer months white crowned sparrows who had here raised their second brood were present in dozens bluebirds too were numerous with the fledglings of both spring and summer and bohemian wax wings had come to join in the general festivity before wandering down the earth for the winter all made the most of this limited vacation joining in the hilarity of the youngsters who had not yet learned to take life seriously for with the bird children that predominated it was an adventure literally thousands of birds were there among them appeared to be a hundred or two robins flocks of rosy finches a few home ptarmigan in their winter stockings gluttonous magpies boisterous clark's nutcrackers insisting on order which they never kept a pair of gray jays from the seclusion of the woods on their yearly outing and pippets crowded almost out of their own home territory even the grouse family was represented by downslope flocks here where a sumptuous feast was spread and there was plenty for all during the short period of celebration birds mingled and intermingled with apparent unconcern 
how different would have been their manner toward rival neighbors in any other season and place the ouzel had fled away along his alpine brook he was not of the crowd he rushed not for the feast but held serenely aloof once he paused to sing the clamor drowned his melody though he was close to me but his throat and gestures told of song following and skimming the stream with every dip and bend that it made he finally dropped with the water behind a cascade merry chipmunks scampered about squirrels from below came in nervous haste and departed early their winter supplies were probably harvested nearer home curiosity alone made them risk the dangers of this promiscuous gathering spot each bird plainly was there for food and fun if the truth were known perhaps no visitor remained long it seemed not unlike a depot of supplies an oasis in the desert or was it also a bureau of information and a reception here all species came for fare provided at a time when there were scanty pickings in regions inhabited the year around for the young birds it was a break in the first long flight for the old ones it offered ideal opportunities to rest a breathing spell after the strenuous demands of raising and training the youngsters the scenes were constantly changing new arrivals disturbed the peace and quiet of the spectacle or making no impression on the moving pageant according to the nature and habits of the intruders and alas more than once as i watched the banqueters some stronger more cunning foe sprang upon them from a hiding place near which they ventured and thinned their ranks a mountain lion and hawks both singly and in numbers appeared in the course of the day there was always a general scattering till they had taken a sure departure uninvited unwelcome guests they seemed to be the outcasts of the forest world but all unconscious were they of the effect which their presence made upon their fellow creatures they exhibited their natural traits of spying prowling and sweeping down upon their prey which was not always successful in eluding them and so one species fed upon another showing the inexorable laws of nature and the bitter struggle for existence which cannot be suspended even during a short and pleasurable trip to this beautiful world of the mountain tops in fact here as elsewhere caution cunning and endurance were required for these wild animal folk to defend themselves in their temporary abiding place their exotic camping ground for a time two coyotes lingered near watching the scene and looking occasionally at each other as if exchanging similar ideas concerning the demonstration one broke away and a few minutes later disappeared down the woods the other sat back on his haunches and as though having forgotten his purpose became deeply engrossed in moral reflection appropriate to the occasion the coyote appears to be the philosopher and the cynic of the wilds though ever hungry ever seeking a feast he seems always ready to show contempt for the duller wits of the world and to indulge in a flow of philosophic thought concerning wild folk habits and follies during a temporary calm in proceedings two deer passed not far away they had perhaps come down from a moorland where early snows temporarily covered their grazing land a number of bighorn sheep which had long been enjoying these unusual demonstrations in their stamping ground stood gazing from a gallery of a boulder pile they had no fear of being molested for in a fraction of a second they could drop off the ledge and descend into the canyon in safety i could have watched this mixed populace of the wilderness 
not only for hours but for days what i had seen was only a small part of that wonderful transformation of the quiet treeless realm which occurs once a year occupying with variations several days it is a strange and scenic common meeting place of bird and beast friend and foe end of chapter six chapter seven of the adventures of a nature guide by enos mills this librivox recording is in the public domain naturalist meets prospector no treetop adventures were in my plans when one autumn afternoon i started out for a three weeks trip on the summit slopes of the rocky mountains nor was i planning to have discussions with prospectors their ways were not mine nor my ways theirs which fact as will be seen caused me trouble i thought to be in the wilds alone i carried no firearms just a raincoat a few pounds of raisins and a hatchet along the way i intended to visit beaver colonies trees at timberline alpine lakes and glacier meadows and hoped to extend my acquaintance with that strange tree the lodgepole pine i had made many similar trips and was ready as usual to delay and watch wild animals by the hour or to turn aside and investigate any subject of interest whether new or old for a while all went smoothly a few miles from my cabin i came to a number of beaver colonies on the slope of long's peak they were strung bead-like in the shallow channel of a stream along the top of a gigantic moraine that thrust forward like a great delta from a canyon at that time it was commonly believed that winter weather could be foretold from the autumn preparations of beavers if they raised the height of their dam and deepened the pond it meant cold weather and unusually thick ice if they laid in an extra large food supply it meant that the winter would be long i had assumed this theory to be correct but on this trip i had to change my old belief in beaver weather wisdom at one place two colonies side by side had made unlike preparations in one extensive and almost complete preparations had been made for the winter in the other the beavers had just begun to cut down trees for the winter food supply and neither house nor dam had been repaired after i had seen many similar cases it was impressed upon me that the extent of the preparations which beavers made for winter was determined by the requirements of the colony chiefly by the number of beavers in it if dam or house was repaired it was because it needed repairs beginning these preparations early or beginning them late might be due to the greater or less amount of work to be done or to the individuality of the leader of a colony i lingered among crags in a moorland above the timberline and watched a flock of bighorn sheep a number were feeding others were playing and a few were lying down two sentinels each poised upon a commanding rock were eternally vigilant for possible danger they appeared not to suspect a nearby enemy on a rock cliff that cut into the sky a mountain lion crouched and occasionally raised his head for more than an hour he lay looking down on the sheep when the sheep started to feed away from these rocks the lion descended and disappeared the first treetop incident of my trip though interesting lacked the amusing yet annoying features of the later ones in what is now wild basin in the rocky mountain national park while examining peeled places in high limbs evidently the work of porcupines i chanced to look across a small nearby opening and saw a little black bear ambling along he walked up to a limber pine 
and climbed into it three limbs that outshot from the trunk about thirty feet above the earth afforded a resting place and he lay down upon his back and apparently at once went to sleep black bears may almost be considered perching animals for much of the time when not active they rest or sleep in a treetop each bear appears to have one or more trees in his territory that he regularly uses then began my adventures in the neighborhood of arapahoe peak i climbed into another treetop hoping to discover the cause of the tree's dying condition climbing outward on a huge steeply inclined limb i hugged it closely and from time to time stopped to look carefully into the crevices of the broken bark a stockman was concealed behind a tree clump a short distance away watching me he was quite unable to understand why an unarmed person should be prowling through the woods miles from anywhere and why anyone should climb into a tree and examine it so minutely was beyond his comprehension his astonishment knew no bounds when i descended and rapidly removed earthy matter from the roots so as to examine them from this treetop i had seen and decided to examine a tall spruce which appeared to be dying from a beetle attack and i hoped to discover the species of insect that was doing the damage toward this tree i walked rapidly and hurriedly climbed up into it the stockman's curiosity got the better of him he made haste to follow me and reached the bottom of the tree about the time i had gained the limb entanglement in the top throwing up a club to attract my attention he demanded which one of the monkey families are you a member of anyway i descended to have a talk with him my explanation of nature's study as the motive for the strange actions he had witnessed was accepted evidently with a proverbial grain of salt but as i appeared harmless he let the matter pass and told me something of himself droughty conditions on the plains had led him to drive his small herd of cattle into the mountains where there was luxuriant feed in a number of adjacent meadows the stockman had a cabin nearby as for a number of days i had been living on bark and berries i gladly accepted his invitation and went over to supper he was born in texas had been a cowboy in that state and elsewhere in the southwest and he entertained me mightily until midnight with stirring snatches of biography then i bade him good night went back to my old raincoat crawled into it built a fire and lay down to sleep we had parted the best of friends but in the night a wolf played me a shabby trick he raided the stockman's sparsely populated hen-roost and carried off a chicken which he stopped to devour close to my camp a few tell-tale feathers were left the following day the stockman called my attention to them and warned me that it would not be well for me to take another chicken i protested my innocence but appearances were against me here you are he said without a piece of bacon or a scrap of food of any kind you don't have a gun or any means of procuring food in the wilderness you have no visible means of support not even your next meal is in sight men are often hanged on less satisfactory evidence the next night another chicken disappeared and the following morning i was awakened early and rather violently confronted by a stockman and a winchester and told to leave the country speedily i saw the futility of argument and quickly complied arriving an hour or so later on buchanan pass about eleven thousand feet above sea level i looked back down the mountain with the recent encounter fresh in mind i did not wish to risk again being taken for a lunatic or a suspicious character no one was in sight so i stopped to examine a number of sprawling storm-battered trees soon becoming absorbed in their interesting features the place was dry and windswept 
most of the trees were limber pines along the continental divide the wind blows violently sometimes for days many of the trees were so wind worn that they appeared a million years old numbers were able to grow only a foot or so above the level of the earth the wind's terrific sand blasts cut off every exposed leaf and twig at one place nearly an acre was covered with low dense tree growth having a low shelter to the windward the trees had grown up to the height of nearly two feet above this they were trimmed off almost as level as a lawn again and again through countless summers the twigs had grown up only to be mown off the following winter by flying sand this had resulted in a crowded matted spiny growth more dense and a great deal more rigid than a hedge top that has been annually trimmed for a generation i walked readily all over the top and only occasionally did my feet break through what a nice spring mattress it would have made jumping into a treetop or falling out of it here was but a commonplace performance several miles down the western slope of the mountain a number of pieces of rich gold float had recently been discovered but i was not long permitted to revel in such fancies while i was examining the little six-foot timberline forest three prospectors appeared they accosted me with a request for my business i told them of my interest in these storm-shaped trees they wanted to know what there was unusual about them i tried to explain the great age of these trees the forces that had dwarfed and distorted them they asked me for a piece of bacon i had none they desired to know where my roll of blankets was. I told them I did not carry one. They wanted to know what kind of gun I used. To find that I was unarmed was too much for them. One asked me where I came from. He was promptly answered by one of the others, who expressed the conviction that I was from an insane asylum. This was another case where explanations would avail nothing quickly leaving these unsympathetic fellows i crossed the mountain descending the western slope i stopped occasionally to examine the trees and the tree clumps and to talk here and there to an individual old spruce without my knowing it the prospectors had followed me they thought i might have located a rich mine and my queer conduct in their eyes was simply a ruse to throw them off their guard when far down the slope i concluded to count the number of trees in about an acre of dense spruce growth after measuring the area i paced back and forth among the trees touching each in turn talking to one now and then and making many oral comments all the time without my suspecting it the three prospectors lay hidden nearby watching my every move hearing some things i said and doubtless commenting scornfully upon the show on this acre were two thousand seven hundred and forty one spruces i discovered a charred pitch pine stump in the spruce area it was closely surrounded by spruces about two hundred years of age the presence of this fire colored fire charred stump puzzled me for I did not then know that this region had been swept by a forest fire about two hundred years before, and that the stump had received fire preservation treatment, which enabled it to endure with but little change. With my hatchet I split off a piece of wood, and drawing my magnifying glass, lay down to examine it. This proceeding was too much for the prospectors. They rushed upon me, demanding to know if I had found gold, and were disgusted to see me examining a piece of pitch pine. Their comments were so uncivil that I promptly left them and wandered away into the woods. Again, without my knowledge, they followed. After traveling about a mile, I came to a glacial meadow surrounded by an Engelmann spruce growth. 
in the margin between spruce and meadow i found a splendid grove of lodgepole pines and stopped to examine them they too were nearly two hundred years of age they stood close together and the crowding had prevented their being much more than towering poles about one hundred feet high the lodgepole pine lives one of the most interesting stories in all the forest world it is a pioneer tree one of the first and most successful to take possession of burned over areas it is most easily killed by fire yet every forest fire that sweeps its territory proves an advantage to it throughout the west in the last fifty years the numerous forest fires have enabled the lodgepole greatly to extend its holdings a complete cessation of forest fires would also exterminate it it may be said to cooperate with fires so closely is its life interrelated with them it begins to bear seeds at an early age often it hoards all its seeds keeping them in cones and the cones upon the tree year after year sometimes for twenty years or longer but if a fire sweeps its territory the wax is melted from the cones that survive they at once open and the seeds fall out to drop into ash-covered soil a place where they will thrive the best the fire had consumed insect enemies and removed the cause of shade most young trees will not grow without shade but young lodgepoles will not grow in it they thrive best in the full glare of the sun trees of other species that come among them and grow taller shade and exterminate them i was particularly drawn to one old fellow in this grove it was without limbs for the first fifty or sixty feet and tapered so little that its trunk at the first limbs appeared to have a thickness about equal to its diameter only a few feet above the roots this was a fraction more than twelve inches eager to know the diameter at the first limbs i climbed up seating myself comfortably on the lowest limb i was just in the act of measuring the trunk diameter when below i caught sight of the three approaching prospectors near my tree they stopped and stared up at me having no use for them in fact feeling myself above them i paid no attention but went on measuring presently one called what in the blankety blank are you doing up there come down and be quick about it down i slid plainly they were greatly put out though i had certainly done them no harm they seemed to consider my incomprehensible performance a personal affront and were likely to handle me roughly when still three to four feet above the earth i leaped from the tree and the three heavy-booted men all kicked at me at once they all missed me they made a number of kicks but being agile i managed each time to be just where their feet were not presently they ceased kicking and declared that i had been purposely misleading them all day my denial did not help matters but they finally cut short the interview by demanding that i vanish into the woods as this was just what i wanted to do i complied and on the way home unhampered by further misunderstandings of the scientific spirit i continued my acquaintance with that interesting pioneer tree the lodgepole pine end of chapter seven chapter eight of the adventures of a nature guide by enos mills this librivox recording is in the public domain the white cyclone one bright winter day while snowshoeing through the san juan mountains i saw a snowslide make a most spectacular run a many thousand ton cliff had fallen several hundred feet upon an enormous snow and ice field 
I was standing on a ridge above the timberline with peaks rising high before me when the crashing echoes warned me of what was happening. The slide's first move was a high dive. The dislodged mass of snow, ice, and stones plunged down an extremely steep, smooth slope. Then it slid and rammed a cliff. As it went on, it rammed various obstructions and finally started two other avalanches moving. I first caught sight of the snow slide as it struck a low cliff. This contact crushed tons of snow and ice to powder. The snow dust was whirled into a gigantic geyser-like column a few hundred feet wide and more than half a mile high. It remained for several seconds the highest object in the sky, the bright sun and blue heavens behind it, then slowly disbanded. With volume and momentum increasing as it advanced, the slide rushed downward, pursued by an enormous train of curling, whirling snow flour and ice powder, a white cyclone. One glimpse that I had of this gravity-mad monster showed its front rapidly rolling and wildly somersaulting forward. At the bottom of the slope, the slide mass must have been 300 feet wide, half as high, and two blocks or more long. With the momentum gained in its run, the slide rushed a quarter of a mile up a slope which lay in its path and ascended about 300 feet. The uphill coasting caused telescoping, a shortening in the length, a massing and enlarging of the front. With thousands of tons of rock in its terrible front, it hit a low lateral moraine at right angles, tearing an opening through the top. There was an explosion, without flying stones and snow, and more telescoping occurred. The top of the slide plunged forward, mingling with the upward, backward, hurled front. As it struck, another splendid white dust column rolled up and lingered for a time in the sky. In tearing through the moraine, the snow slide was deflected to the left, where it slid up a moderate slope. Then it curved to the right and started downgrade. On the monster swept. Occasionally a section leaped high and tumbled upon the mass in front. It rounded the face of the slope, cutting a contour in the deep snow and loose stones. Finally it slid out on a level flat and after a wild coast of three miles came to a sudden standstill. In stopping, the bottom appeared to put on brakes and drag heavily the top to pitch forward and the upbursting bottom to mingle with it. When it stopped, it was a dark dump of convulsed snow that covered an area about three blocks long, one wide, and perhaps 50 feet deep. The wreckage was a gray, concrete-like mass of snow, earth, gravel, and stones. One summer, a few years later, I saw the remnant of this snow slide. Most of the snow and ice had melted. Viewed from the top of the ridge across which it had rushed, the remaining wreckage appeared like the ruins of a huge building in a little grassy plain. Conies and marmots had taken possession of the crumbling earth and stones. Commonly, a snow slide follows a gulch and does not race so wildly. The slide to be feared is the one that takes a new route running amuck and smashing obstacles. The big slide described was an unusual one of this type. Such a slide may be the result of a snowdrift in a new place, may be caused by the wind blowing from an unusual quarter, or may be started by a land or rock slide or the undermining of an old snow pile. As soon as the slide stopped, I started along the wreck-strewn way over which it had run. It had traveled a crooked course and opened a ragged channel through the snow. Its widest track was nearly 400 feet, but over the most of its meteoric 
course its forced passageway was less than one hundred feet wide off this most of the snow had been scraped every loose and detachable object was carried away in spots its snout had gouged into the earth along the track were scattered stones and snow piles a few places showed that the momentum of the slide had caused it to jump without touching the earth it had leaped one ravine more than fifty feet wide tons of shattered rock were swept forward mostly in the bottom of the slide at one point a heavy granite rock thrust up ten or twelve feet in the track striking this caused no perceptible check in its wild speed but there was a muffled explosion stones were flung from the sides and hurled through the top of the slide clouds of snow dust were thrown off this contact must have thrown the internal part of the slide into fierce confusion in following the open way through which the main slide tore i found where this slide had started two others one of which i heard and the other i both saw and heard their swift spectacular careers and their wild sudden endings were graphically demonstrated shown in the torn and imprinted snow these slides were set in motion just after the main slide was well under way although i did not see slide number two i heard it slide number three i both saw and heard at one point the main slide had dislodged a number of boulders the small boulders started a miniature slide that after slipping a short distance came to a standstill one boulder must have weighed fifty tons this enormous fellow had gone bounding down a slope with long leaps striking a snowdrift and a rock pile which lay at the top of a steep glaciated incline down this incline plunged slide number two gathering all the snow and stones along the way as the slide came into the bottom of the canyon it hit a small ice-bound lake that lay in a rocky basin smashing the ice and sweeping out most of the water the further canyon wall was deluged with water which promptly froze into a rough ice sheet the slide however continued on its way just beyond the lake it rammed the canyon wall at an angle apparently it was thrown off to the right and turned upside down ice cakes and stones were scattered and piled in the bottom of the canyon torn and splashed places in the snow far up the canyon walls showed where flying stones had struck the slide rushed on down the gorge and after a run of nearly a mile its terrific momentum caused it to jump completely out of the gorge on the outside of a curve at a point where the wall was low this ended its career a high and long enduring dust column ascended from the place where it landed gravity is the pull that moves snow as well as water slides need a slope for their coasting on a steep smooth slope a comparatively small accumulation or weight of snow will slide off but if the slope is somewhat flattened or extremely rough an enormous quantity may be required for the starting or if the weather be warm when the first autumn snow falls it may partly melt and freeze fast this icy cement will probably endure until spring most slides follow the channels of water courses slides may be ordinarily divided into storm annual and century a storm slide may run during or shortly after the snowstorm the annual supply for the spring will carry most of the winter's accumulation of snow the century the accumulation of scores of winters the century snow slide often does much damage by smashing its way down through forests making as it were a right-of-way of its own 
a storm slide too may be a dangerous and damaging one if there is an unusual fall of snow from an uncommon quarter or if this snow is drifted in an unusual place it like the century slide will smash down over a new track and leave a line of wreckage behind it the third slide was also started by the first slide striking a mass of snow and stones in the upper end of a shallow ravine for more than a mile this third slide ran on a course parallel with that of the first in a weirdly spectacular race then slide number three swerved and followed a crescent-shaped course to the right a succession of short-lived snow clouds were thrown explosively off as it struck obstructions i caught sight of this slide just as a flock of bighorn sheep rushed out of the snow dust on one side like frightened people almost struck by a flying express it is probable that one or two of the sheep were caught and carried down by the slide as the dust cleared two injured sheep were seen limping along far behind the others another flock alarmed by the chaotic echoings rushed upon a cliff there in tense and splendid poses singly and in groups they watched the rushing slide this slide ran two miles descending about fifteen hundred feet most of its descent was in the first half mile and on the last part of its run it moved slowly at timberline it plunged headlong over a precipice a leap of about four hundred feet landing upon a steep and heavily forested slope several thousand trees were overthrown and smashed to splinters the striking power of this mass of snow and stones cannot be computed the slide probably weighed about two hundred thousand tons on striking the flying mass was thrown forward stones had bounded in all directions cutting off trees to right and left the forest within two hundred feet from the slide's landing place was ruined by this short terrific bombardment a trainload of stones and many tons of earth were dropped a part of the slide mass ran on and smashed down through the forest breaking off or tearing out by the roots every tree in its course its path was narrow about one hundred feet but over this width it ran through the forest for about seven hundred feet with apparently unchecked speed at the end of this stretch it plunged into a rocky canyon nearly filling it with spruce pulp splinters cordwood earthy convulsed snow and shattered stones there were more than two hundred annual rings in the trees wrecked here showing that there had not been a slide at this place for two hundred years in looking over the debris at the bottom of the precipice i came upon the body of a grizzly bear badly crushed apparently the bear had been torn from his shallow hibernating cave somewhere in the track of the slide probably a short distance above timberline careful search failed to reveal the body of a sheep still there may have been a number of carcasses beneath the smashed trees and wreckage how quickly all this had happened i had heard the crash boom and rumble and the riot of echoes and then had seen a surprised snowfield suddenly awakened and rushing forward wrapped in excited snow dust above its resting place i saw the transient mile-high snow dust pillar silently rise the echoes ceased and this dust monument quickly vanished. End of chapter 8